welcome to Living One. My name is Olivia Crossman. I am your host. Living One is a monthly webinar series in which presenters from around the world share their vision for a future where all Earth beings live as one community in peace, dignity, and freedom. We ask the question, we know what's wrong, but what does right look like? <laughs> this last fall marked the beginning of Living One's fourth year, but today these conversations are more important than ever. For they are more than conversations. They are opportunities to build community, solve for the isolating wounds of our time. Today, we have the third session of our summer series, Veganism at the Crossroads of Human Identity and Cultural Change. This series will explore the deep reappraisal of human identity and culture for which veganism asks. Over the next three weeks, our speakers will reflect on the issues and questions at this critical cusp in the evolution of human consciousness as our species moves from what we refer to as nature consciousness. We are delighted to have you join us as we explore this important topic together. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are all currently on various different indigenous lands. I am currently on the ancestral homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, which includes the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. This land exists also as a place of trade with other indigenous communities, including the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Menominee, Sauk, and Meskwaki. The Krulo Center for Nonviolence, located in Southern Oregon, is also the homelands of the Grizzly Bear, Tacoma, Daku Batate, Coyote, Coho Salmon, Golden Eagle, and Gray Wolf. To recognize the land is to recognize the lasting effects of colonization, genocide, and oppression that still impact indigenous communities today. Looks like we got the screen share going. Screen share going. Hold on. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> okay, <laughs> one sec, we'll get back to that. Um, okay, to recognize the land is to recognize the lasting effects of colonization, genocide, and oppression that still impact indigenous communities today but it is also an expression of gratitude and appreciation for the land and for all those whose homelands we live and work on. In the third of this five-part series, we welcome Karen Davis. Karen is the founder and president of the United Poultry Concerns, including the Alliance to End Chickens Escaporos, dedicated to the compassionate and respectful treatment of domesticated birds founded in 1990. She will discuss the suffering and abuses of chickens in farming operations, sacrificial atonement rituals, and farm supply businesses, and explain how we can restore birds lucky enough to be rescued to a sense of their true selves instead of how the lesser beings to which abusers seek to reduce them. This project extrapolates to a larger vision and undertaking of rescue. Karen is the author of numerous publications, including the books Prison Chickens, Poison Eggs, An Inside Look at the Modern Poultry Industry, More Than a Meal, The Turkey in History, Myth, Ritual, and Reality, and The Holocaust and the Handmaid's Tale, A Case for Comparing Atrocities. Before we begin, let me share a few logistical notes. Karen will be speaking for 45 minutes, after which we will have 15 minutes for question and answer. In order to proceed in a timely manner, we ask that you do please send your questions along in the chat during Karen's presentation, and we will read them out after she's finished. For anyone who isn't familiar with the Zoom chat function, if you move your cursor towards the bottom of your screen, you'll see a number of icons appear, one of which is the chat function towards the center left of your screen. If you click on that, the chat will appear, and you can type any questions or comments as we go. We have two members of our Krulos community here with us today, Jenny and Diksha, who will be monitoring the chat throughout our time together. Also, please note that the Zoom session will be recorded. So if you would feel more comfortable leaving your camera off or changing your Zoom name, please feel free to do so. Finally, we ask that unless you're currently speaking, you keep your microphone muted to avoid any unintended interruptions. So without further ado, we welcome Karen Davis. Hi, Karen. Hi, Olivia. Great to be here again with gratitude. Yes. <laughs> We're so glad to have you back on. Thank you. I'm glad to be back on. To start us off. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, welcome. So to start us off, do you want to tell us a little bit about your arc um, and just how you got to the work you're doing today? Sure. Well, I founded United Poultry Concerns in 1990. Uh, to promote the compassionate and respectful treatment of chickens, turkeys, ducks, and other domesticated birds, specifically those birds who have the misfortune of being considered a food source 
for human beings. I did not grow up around chickens or turkeys or even ducks for that matter in Pennsylvania. Um, but uh, when I met a chicken, I was instantly moved and uh, a companion and advocate for life for that bird. Um, I met a hen named Viva, whose story is on our permanently posted on our website. And uh, she was so moving to me and so, so sweet and dear. She was very crippled. She had belonged to our landlady in Maryland, who was raising about a hundred chickens every year, as we learned, my husband and I at the time, um, if, in order to maintain her agricultural tax status. Because as people know, if you're in agriculture, you get all kinds of tax breaks, especially animal agriculture. So you let the tax other taxpayers foot your bill. Mm. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and, and so one day, all of the chickens who I had been in the habit of visiting every day when I discovered them by accident on a little walk one day in June of 1998, um, and I would visit them every day and they were so glad to see me. It was so obvious to have that they had a visitor and somebody who paid attention to them. Mm -hmm. And then one day they were all gone. And the next day I was walking past this little, sh it was really a shack, this shack. And I saw these feathers sort of floating in there. And I went around and opened that little door again that was tied shut but with a shoestring. And I looked in and I saw movement inside. And lo and behold, there was a little hen, very crippled, under uh, a platform that was full of farm equipment, old used, rusted farm equipment. Mm -hmm. And rather than go into the story, I'll just say, go to our website and you can read the story I tell about her and how, how sweet she was and how important her life became to me as of course it was to her and with a rather sad ending, but at least she was saved long enough to be loved and to be cared for. And um, she had just a radical effect on me. So anyway, one thing led to another. I did some sanctuary work, some volunteer sanctuary work at what for a while was a PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals Sanctuary in Washington, DC. Uh, they didn't maintain it for long, but while they did, uh, it turned out that uh, I, our first two other chickens were a rooster named Henry, who was used for breeding purposes, mm -hmm. who had fallen off a truck on the way on the way to the slaughterhouse. It was obvious this was his who he was and what it, where he was going. Mm -hmm. He was very dirty. He had been severely debeaked, and he was a very scared and angry rooster. Mm -hmm. But after a couple months with me, he couldn't wait to be hugged and kissed. And he just loved to be held. And um, he loved it when I would put him and this little hen from that same PETA Aspen Hill Sanctuary in the tomato garden. Mm -hmm. And he groaned. It wasn't, I wasn't raising the tomatoes, but our landlady and her friend were raising them. Mm -hmm. And he was so thrilled to be in that tomato garden and to be able to eat as many tomatoes as he wanted. They said he could have all the tomatoes he wanted. And he would just groan in ecstasy. And he just became a completely transformed rooster. <laughs> and um, as I say, he lived with a little white hen. We named Henrietta. There's more to the story. But the point is, those were the first three chickens I really knew. And then I worked um, one summer for six weeks at what was then the fledgling organization Farm Sanctuary, which at that time was based in Avondale, Pennsylvania. It was just a very, very small operation on uh, 25 acres belonging to another farm. Mm -hmm. So those were my early experiences with uh, chickens. And um, by the time 1989 rolled around, I was very uh, determined to start an organization that would focus on the plight and what I had discovered was also the delight of these birds. 
So mm -hmm. officially in October 1990, we became a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to chickens, turkeys, ducks, and other domesticated birds, which we continue to do every day. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's a beautiful arc. And it's the individuals you met on your path. I love how they, what, what an important role they played in, in the story and learning about them and their lives is so wonderful. Um, so the title of your talk about what animal liberation really means. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? What does animal liberation mean? Maybe how is it misconstrued? What does it mean to you? Um, and of course, particularly in, in respect to the farmed animals, uh, chickens and vegan ad advocacy. Well, I think of farmed animal, well, animal liberation generally and farmed animal liberation in particular, mm -hmm. um, two particular and totally related categories. Hmm. One is obviously uh, liberating them from how they are used hmm. and from being used in the first place. Uh, we have these categories in which we place various animals. We have wild animals, we have uh, animals in entertainment, uh, animals in laboratories, so-called farmed animals, uh, racing horses, and uh, the hugest category of all, which is farmed animals. And unfortunately, farmed animals in particular are the least, I would say, appreciated of all the different categories of animals, uh, with the possible exception of rodents, particularly in the lab animal industry, but people have this attitude toward farmed animals. Well, they're put here for us to eat or they're put here for us to have their eggs or their milk. Um, so there's this old idea that, you know, based in religious attitudes and then later science picks up on it and uh, makes use of that idea in secular terms that uh, other animals, non-human animals, farmed animals in particular, are put here for us to use, that God or uh, God put them, put them here for us. And you can tell them, well, but chickens evolved in the tropical forests of Southeast Asia, and they existed long before human beings ever found them, and probably long before we even existed. So Actually, there's no evidence that they were put here by anybody for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the secularization of that idea, well, we're the apex predator and we're at the top of the food chain. That doesn't sound, they, those terms don't sound very scientific, but, uh, but they, they appear in the scientific so-called lexicon uh, mm -hmm. to justify the fact that, you know, we're at the top. And um, all the other animals and food animals, farmed animals um, in particular, are put here for us to consume. Mm. So trying to overcome the view of farmed animals, chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, goats, pigs, cows, calves, etc., cetera, um, to uh, try to penetrate those uh, barriers of thought that mm -hmm. confine them in these categorical boxes um, to see them for who they are rather than define them for as to how we use them mm -hmm. and to ultimately liberate them from being used in the first place. I mean, obviously, we promote an animal-free vegan diet mm -hmm. and life as much as that's possible to uh, practice in the real world, but certainly veganism can easily be practiced almost everywhere. So we want people to stop viewing these animals as food animals, because as soon as somebody is called a food animal, well then, okay, it's like down here on the Eastern shore of Virginia, where we're located in a big poultry producing area. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, and where you see the trucks taking the poor chickens up and down the road to the slaughter plants, mm -hmm. uh, people, even people who keep chickens as pets or backyard chickens and who love their chickens, they say they do, and I believe them, but they often make a distinction between 
their chickens, whom they love, and the chickens who are going up and down the road who are meant for food. And it's kind of like, well, I don't even engage at all with those chickens because they're predetermined to be food. So they're in a different category, although they're not, as far as they're concerned, they're, they have the same beating hearts, the same feelings, the same fears, the same potential to have happiness and the same uh, potential for misery. And in their case, all they get to know is misery and pain and injury and then a horrible death. So there's the actual way the birds are forced to live and the other farmed animals are forced to live because they're farmed animals who are considered and treated as farmed animals brought into the world for that purpose. Um, and then again, there are these uh, verbal categories, these re rhetorical categories that distance us from them, that alienate us from them. Um, the industry, for example, calls chickens bred for the meat industry broilers. They don't even call them broiler chickens. They just refer to them as broilers. Um, they refer to hens used for if, by the egg industry as layers. That's L-A-Y-E-R-S. They're defined by what their destination is, either to be broiled or to lay eggs until they're slaughtered. And um, terms like um, steer, for example, S-T-E-E-R, for a castrated bull. Uh, it's very difficult, I'd say, for the average person to relate to an animal who is called a steer. And then uh, take the word swine, which is the industry term for pigs. Well, nobody relates to a, pig, a creature called swine. And of course, if, as we know from uh, the Judeo-Christian uh, Bible, that the term swine is a pejorative term. And at least as it's translated into English, and uh, and and then we uh, call people who we despise or who has done something we hate um, swine. So to call an animal a swine is to predetermine a view of them as somebody or something undesirable, disgusting, um, not worth caring about or even worth living, better off mm -hmm. to be bacon and pork, you know, <laughs> and uh, make money off of them and eat them. Um, so the language is, is very, very important that we use. And we want to try to uh, get people to view these animals differently uh, through the language that we are using, for example, and not only farmed animals, but animals in general are still referred to by many people and in, and in the news media as it's. They <laughs> use a pronoun that uh, uh, suggests that the animal is an object or a <laughs> thing, uh, a who, instead of uh, a rather an, 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 a, a thing, an, a, a which or uh, a that instead of a who or a whom. So this is a campaign, actually. I think it was originally originally started as a campaign by In Defense of Animals, I believe, and still ongoing, of course, and we're certainly part of that. And most of the animal movement is now, too, uh, mm -hmm. that we try to uh, correct people when they refer to, like, I, uh, I, I have to, I have this rooster, I have to get rid of it. You know, <laughs> somebody says that to me on the phone, uh, you know, first of all, just saying I have to get rid of it. I always have to say, well, what do you mean? You need to find a new home for him. And they say um, him. Um, uh, OK, yeah, him. Anyway, I have to get rid of it. <laughs> it's like you're you know, you're trying to be nice. But still, hey, look, we're talking about him, not it. All right. Um, so, but again, the terms that are used for farmed animals, and then, you know, there's these uh, ways of thinking about chickens, which is completely false. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, you're chicken, you're a coward, right? Mm -hmm. uh, don't, don't be chicken, uh, be, be brave. Well, that is so ridiculous. You know, I've been keeping chickens since 1985, and chickens are not cowards at all. I mean, a, a mother hen will fly at a, a a predator, uh, she will risk her life as if need be 
to protect herself and her chicks and especially her chicks. And roosters are exactly the same. I mean, we've had a couple of roosters who actually died trying to protect their hens. Mm -hmm. um, we're totally predator proof now. We have 12,000 square feet of predator proof outdoor sanctuary, uh, which we uh, completed in 2014. But you know, along the way, you know, I learned some lessons and I learned how vulnerable chickens are to predators. Mm -hmm. And uh, I certainly learned how they will do everything to protect themselves. And they're not cowards at all. And just because uh, an animal has legs to run away from uh, a perceived uh, uh, enemy, or threat, that doesn't make them a coward per se. I mean, horses run away from wolves and we don't call them, you know, we don't call, say you're a horse because you run away or run away. <laughs> <laughs> so again, there are just all these uh, um, stereotypes, mm -hmm. which um, now not all stereotypes are necessarily false. Mm -hmm. Some stereotypes are simply generalizations of, of certain facts or evidence. But these are negative and these are negative stereotypes, which are also false, yeah. because when you really get to know the animals in question, you get to meet them, uh, you see how they actually behave in different situations, then you can match that ex direct experience with the, um, the false stereotypes, mm -hmm. with the uh, conventional attitudes uh, and assumptions that people make. And do your best to try to educate people to uh, see these animals for who they are, again, rather than through the um, screening and barrier of uh, language and usage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So liberation means liberating them from being used, period, mm -hmm. liberating them from being perceived as usable, and liberating them from a language which disparages them and uh, uh, renders them uh, some something inferior mm -hmm. uh, to uh, things that are uh, beings who are not inferior or considered mm -hmm. non-inferior or mm -hmm. are considered less inferior. And I mean, it's really interesting when you read a lot of the literature from the past, as of course I have done. And for a long time, there was this, even going well into the early 20th century, um, among even ornithologists, not all, but there's still this lingering attitude that birds are somehow inferior to mammals mm. and that um, birds are, uh, like I remember an reading a book with an ornithologist saying about, chick about hens, um, mother birds, m uh, mother birds. He said, they don't really know why they make a nest. They're just um, acting on instinct. And well, yeah, it, it, it is an instinct to um, make a nest, but that doesn't mean that that instinct is not fully accompanied by knowledge of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I mean, we all operate by instinct. Um, mm -hmm. We have an instinct to make our beds and make our shelters and to eat and drink and uh, fall in love and have children if we choose to have children or not. We might have an instinct to not have a child. But the point is, the fact that something is an instinct doesn't explain away um, mm -hmm. feelings or mm -hmm. desires or experiences that are within that being. But there has been that attitude that birds were inferior. They were just kind of acting on automatic. They don't know why they do what they do. They're just sort of bumping around. And, you know, you can just think how stupid that idea is that they're stupid. Because how could they live and thrive in any kind of environment, let alone, you know, changing environments, um, if they were so stupid that they and, re, and unresilient that they couldn't adapt and learn things and understand what they're doing and why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And especially with what you were saying about them making a nest. I mean, when, when women are pregnant, we often say they're nesting as well, and that it's an right. instinctual thing, but we don't take away from the fact that they know exactly what they're doing while they're nesting. <laughs> right. And they have very strong feelings. Of course. About their, about their, you know, their, uh, uh, uh unborn child, their child about to be, uh, you know, they have very strong feelings. Um, the, the instinct is accompanied by appropriate feelings. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And that's true of other animals as well as of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Well, just getting people to think about us as ourselves as animals. I mean, mm-hmm. they, you know, we're, I, I'm always trying to, as much as possible when I'm writing or speaking, to speak about humans and other animals mm-hmm. because people, many people are still resistant to thinking of themselves as a member of the animal kingdom, as a mm-hmm. fellow animal, as an animal. It's very difficult. And I tell mm-hmm. people, well, animal means endowed with the breath of life. That's mm-hmm. what it means. It even means that in Hebrew, something along that line. All of life, uh, all flesh is uh, endowed with the breath of life. So we're part of that uh, great group of beings that includes ourselves, but also includes all the rest of the birds, the mammals, the, all the aquatic creatures, the creatures of the sea and rivers. And uh, now we know more and more about insects and the uh, feelings of insects as well. So the more we learn, the more we learn, well, the more we come to understand that this planet is teething, teething or no, teeming. <laughs> teeming. <laughs> teeming. <laughs> Not teething. <laughs> <laughs> Getting their teeth all sharpened up to attack. Right. But, um, but uh, you know, this earth is teeming with sentient uh, individuals, with sentient yeah. beings, mm-hmm. uh, ourselves. And all the, uh, the more we learn about other lives, the more we learn that they are sentient, that they experience being alive and they experience their surroundings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that really, I mean, that speaks to the point that you were just making about the language that we use to talk about other animals and just humans hesitancy to consider ourselves as animals really speaks to their negative connotations with the word animal to begin with. Um, That's really, that's fascinating, Karen. And how, so in talking about humans as, as animals or humans, however you want to understand them, how would human liberation then be connected, related, not connected to animal liberation? Um, Do you see them interconnected at all? I see animal liberation and human liberation completely connected. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we are liberated in being ignorant Mm -hmm. of the rest of the world, Mm -hmm. the rest of the planet, the other creatures. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, and I don't think that when we have mean-spirited, mean-spirited attitudes toward other creatures, when we are physically abusive of them, Mm -hmm. and when we treat them with violence, Mm -hmm. um, that we are, I think we're enslaved Mm -hmm. by those behaviors, uh, we're beha- we're enslaved by being cruel and brutal and inhumane and uh, violent toward our fellow creatures, whether our fellow creatures be other human beings or uh, other animals. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are times when, you know, we're forced to defend ourselves, okay, or we have to defend our family. We might have to take an action that otherwise would not be acceptable at all. I, I'm not mm-hmm. going to go into all of that, but there certainly are times when, I mean, I remember years ago at a conference, I think it was our conference, somebody said that even if she was being attacked, because she's against violence, she wouldn't defend herself. Mm. And I said, well, (laughs) that may be you. (laughs) That's not me. (laughs) And if I see somebody, you know, like attacking a a person who is with me or one of our chickens, well, I'm going to try to uh, break that up nonviolently, but I'm not going to stand there and let my mother be beaten to death, you know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I'm against nonviolence on principle. Uh, I mean, I'm because I'm against violence on principle. So there are times when, you know, you have to uh, maybe uh, do things that you that otherwise are not justified at all. But those those occasions are are rare. I mean, what Mm -hmm. we want to do is try everything we can to avoid being violent, to avoid shedding blood. And Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we, we have to become creative and we can become creative if we have the will to do so. Mm-hmm. So, so I believe that uh, animal liberation is human liberation. I think we benefit as human beings for, from becoming more aware of other creatures, becoming more uh, just and compassionate toward them. 
I think uh, we become part of the community of Earth, Earth um, in a more intimate way yeah. than when we isolate and hermetically seal ourselves off from the, less, the rest of the world. As mm -hmm. in Western society, we definitely pretty much are. Mm -hmm. uh, every time I see people, even in situations where maybe they're in a sort of natural environment, but they're always looking at their phone and they're not even like glancing up to look at a, or an actual tree. <laughs> like they are just taking a picture of it to share on the internet, <laughs> uh, to share on uh, uh, Instagram or something. So uh, to me, that's a, that's a real loss. I mean, we want to feel the world around us and we want to be part of it. Why do we want to be separate? Uh, maybe there was a time when there was some excuse for that. I don't know what it would be offhand, but why we want to be separate from all the rest of the world, why we want to look at uh, the rest of the world simply as resources. Mm -hmm. How can we extract from that animal, from that habitat, uh, the maximum that we can grab out of their body or out of their home? Um, that, that attitude that the rest of the living world is just either resources or a wasteland of some something some kind, or we could talk about um, land that is undeveloped. Okay, <laughs> meaning a land that we haven't yet, you know, turned into pavement and buildings and uh, all of that kind of stuff. You know, that land may be a lovely land where uh, uh, other animals enjoy their lives and where there are all kinds of wonderful plants growing. And to call it undeveloped, well, that's a real estate a term, uh, but it's uh, often um, a way that we should not be thinking of the land all the time as undeveloped or other animals as well. Uh, they're, you know, what are their, their resources for us? Otherwise, what good are they? Right, right. Absolutely. And, and thinking along those lines then in, how we consider animals as in different categories of, of how they're useful to us. Um, do you, when, when we're talking about liberation, would you say that it's important to parse liberation according to the category in which the animals are confined or defined? Um, or is it a broader, is it important to consider it as a broader term? Is it is important to consider what? Is it important to consider it as, as a broader term or is it, do we need to get more specific as far as how we discuss liberation is in, in so far as how the animal is defined by our use or confined in their circumstance? Well, again, I, I understand these issues are complicated. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're easy, you know, quick solutions to all of it, but I mean, they, I, I like, I don't even, don't even use, I try to avoid the term wild animals sometimes too, and say free living animals, mm. free living birds, um, because I think it's important, uh, again, for us to realize that uh, what we call wild animals, that's, that's definitely a category mm -hmm. that um, dis dis distances ourselves from them. Well, there's the tame animals and the wild animals. Well, a lot of the tame animals can easily become feral. They can become wild animals again, and they'd probably love to if we would just get our hands off them and open the doors. Um, but I think that um, we want to respect other animals for who they are, and who they are is definitely demonstrated in what they choose when mm -hmm. given an opportunity to make choices. Um, uh, chickens, for example, are not, you know, they're, they essentially the chicken in, inside themselves, their genetic core is that of a wild chicken, of a, a, a wild jungle fowl. That's who they are in, internally. And we need to remember that all the animals we call dist domesticated have wild progenitors, often have wild, um, not just ancestors, but um, and, and, uh, relatives still still roaming the planet and mm -hmm. uh that uh that you know we we have chosen to domesticate certain animals again that doesn't mean that they have been truly domesticated to the point where they cannot live without us i know for example that many uh chickens can go feral very easily 
Mm -hmm. Um, They have been reported uh, as going feral in places like South Carolina, for example, uh, chickens who had been used for cockfighting. Mm -hmm. Uh, They uh, often have gotten loose and they have fled (laughs) fled the plantation and they have uh, uh, gone back to the trees and to raising their families and so on. And um, there was a big study by a a group of um, uh, scientists uh, it's called the, the McBride studies uh, that was uh, done in the 1960s about uh, feral chickens, that is chickens who had been domesticated, but who were had reverted to their free living state and mm. were doing very well. They're living off the coast off of, uh, what is it, Queensland, Australia, mm. and they're raising their families. They go to the sleep in the trees at night. They jump down and roam around and scratch in the ground all day, and they live just like their um, contemporary wild relatives and their ancestors, and uh, they're perfectly able to live on their own. Mm. Um, what mainly prevents a chicken from being, being able to do that is the fact that um, chickens who have been bred for the meat industry, first of all, their feathers are white, so they can't camouflage themselves. And that's true of the white leghorn hens, who were the primary type of hen used for the egg industry. Mm -hmm. Um, In this country, the majority of hens used for the egg industry are white hens. Of course, then their counterparts are white roosters and the same in the chicken meat industry. So the chickens bred for the meat industry are not only pure white, but they are they suffer from uh, uh, infirmities. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are very subject uh, uh, subject. They're easily subjected to heart attacks in their infancy because they're forced to grow so fast and so large that their uh, heart and their lungs uh, cannot supply the, the, the oxygen, the oxygenated blood that they need in order to grow this massively growing body. Mm-hmm. So they have congestive heart failure. They developed such a myriad of ailments um, that uh, you can read my book, Prison Chickens, Poisoned Eggs, and get an idea of, and, and by the way, all of my books are also uh, available as PDF books on our homepage on the left mm-hmm. hand, left hand side. So the books are available in print and as PDFs on our homepage. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that I have included in Prison Chickens, Poisoned Eggs, uh, a number of the many ailments that chickens spread for the meat industry are, are, are subject to. And um, they, can't, they can't really fly up into the trees because they're too heavy. And they're mm. almost always, to some extent, lame, and they are often in a great deal of pain. The way mm. certain people become, if they're extremely heavy, their joints become inflamed and uh, rub against each other, the, uh, the the bones and the cartilage, and that's very painful. Well, mm. you have imposed that condition in these very very young chickens, the 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 in the chicken industry. Mm. So and they can't run fast. So they can't get away from predators. Uh, they just have an infirmity built into their uh, bodies, their physical structure, their physical functioning. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not they don't want to. I've watched chickens who want to take a leap up to something high, and um, they usually can't do it. And maybe when they're very young, they can jump up onto a, a bale of straw, which they will do if they can or maybe up to the first or second rung of a chicken ladder inside their house. Uh, But they can very seldom get up to the top rung. The hens used for the egg industry are in better condition, much better condition. They can easily jump up to the top rung. They can get up into the trees and the bushes, which they get up into every night here at our sanctuary, because again, it's predator proof, so they can sleep in the trees and bushes at night if they prefer. Um, Their problem, the hens bred for the egg industry, is uh, reproductive problems, Mm -hmm. because you take a a chicken hen who has, in nature, would be laying two clutches, adding up to about 24 to 25 eggs per year who has been artificially bred and inbred and overbred to lay between 250 and to 300 eggs per chicken per year. Mm -hmm. So 
their body is very stressed, their reproductive system. <laughs> so therefore, they are very susceptible to an array of reproductive infirmities, ailments, uh, cancers, and so on. So that's usually what causes them to die earlier than they would otherwise. Uh, because once they get to a sanctuary like ours, um, they can recover pretty quickly from living in a cage. Um, they can pretty quickly learn how to do what chickens do. <laughs> uh, but it's usually, again, it's the ovarian tumors. It's um, uh, the, the, as they get a little older, the eggs inside them become larger and larger and more difficult to expel. And that can cause um, uh, various problems, including uh, what's called, um, uh, oh God, uh, 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 ovarian, uh, uh, it's, it's a prolapse where part of the body actually comes out of, uh, out of the body and hangs down. Uh, uterine prolapse is the, the uterus actually comes out of the body and hangs down. And um, again, these are all human caused um, afflictions in these birds. But as, again, as far as like, for example, the birds who are closer to nature are the ones who have been bred for the cockfighting industry. Mm -hmm. um, they are very, very easily able to return to uh, the, living a natural life. As I mentioned, uh, chickens who have uh, escaped from uh, cockfighting estates in South Carolina have been shown to be able to easily go into the woods and just get along fine on their own. Uh, they don't need people <laughs> at all. Uh, and uh, they never did. And so uh, <laughs> uh, again, uh, so much of what uh, chickens can do. And again, other, other animals, pigs, people don't like wild pigs. They don't like feral pigs either, unfortunately, in the South and other places. And they're always shooting them from helicopters and so on. But again, animals are very resilient. And uh, even farmed animals are very resilient and that essential nature usually is intact. And mm -hmm. probably if they were allowed to reproduce over generations, they would increasingly restore their natural original body shape and size and uh, all of the other features that would enable them to live autonomously in the natural world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the thing is, uh, uh, all animals started out wild <laughs> and uh, free living. Mm -hmm. And we have, uh, again, done things to those we wanted to use in particular ways. Um, but really, we want to remember that uh, what is wild to us is the homes, their homes. Those mm -hmm. homes are not wild to them, mm -hmm. uh, only to us. They, those are places that are uninhabitable for humans but not for those who evolved to live in them. Right. So we want people to understand, for example, that chickens come from tropical forests and they're forest dwelling birds and turkeys can live in almost every type of habitat. Um, mm -hmm. They even swim and uh, they can swim quite well. And um, even biologists have said, even when you clip the wings, wings of turkeys, they will do everything they can to uh, go from branch to branch to get up to the topmost branches of a tree because that's where they want to be at night. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, animals have these desires to be who they are as much as possible. And I think we want to appreciate that and allow that to happen as much as possible. Now, some people will say, well, you know, we shouldn't be adopting dogs or cats either because, you know, we bred them artificially and they're not really happy in domestication and all of that. Well, I would differ with that point of view. I think, first of all, um, we have created their situation. So to simply say, to simply abandon them and say, well, you know, we're not going to adopt them. We're not, they're not happy and living in a home. Well, that's not even true. Um, the many times, <laughs> I've hardly known a dog who lived with a good uh, person uh, or people who was an unhappy dog. On the contrary, they seem to me to be ecstatic almost all the time uh, <laughs> and very happy and very well cared for and uh, very loving and loved in return. And certainly uh, cats too, you know, they have good lives. They may not be perfect lives, but who has a perfect life? Uh, so uh, that doesn't mean you don't want to live at all 
or mm-hmm. that you know you should or that somebody should just abandon you and say well you know they they should have been wild and now they're domesticated and so we're that was wrong and so we're just going to let them go so again right. you know we have to use common sense as well as you know invoke our ethics and mm-hmm. and what what kind of life we want for our fellow animals and uh and how we want to share life with them that doesn't mean um uh, that sharing might be just letting them be as mm-hmm. much as possible and giving them the land and the water to be able to be. Mm-hmm. If we keep taking their worlds away from them, where are they going to go? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that's such a good point. Um, I'm sure people have lots of questions. I want to make sure to leave time for that. So I'll ask you one more before, before we transition. Um, so as far as the, the lexicon of animal liberation, would you say that some animals, um, including humans, are considered more equal than others um, and why this might happen? Well, I think I have kind of covered that uh, a bit. Um, yeah. you know, wild, for example, among in the environmental environmental movement, there's, uh, there, there's this, an attitude, well, wild animals, you know, they're autonomous. Um, they they they're more valuable because mm-hmm. uh, they're they're able to live on their own and raise their families. And there's been this attitude of uh, contempt for uh, cows, for example, and chickens because they allowed themselves to be domesticated. Mm-hmm. And and there has been this false idea in the environmental movement. Not everybody, but there's definitely this very strong strain going back, for example, to the 1970s in environmentalist uh, discourse that, uh, that, that, you know, farmed animals are uh, inferior. Uh, they are, are inferior because they let themselves be domesticated. Mm-hmm. And there's this attitude, for example, expressed by um, a writer uh, named Joe Hutto, who incubated um, a number of turkeys a number of years ago. And he wrote a very good and interesting book called Illumination in the Flatlands, Mm. a season with the wild turkey. And what happened was um, he was on a quail hunting farm in Florida, I think Northern Florida, but anyway, Florida. And it was being plowed up, you know, to make it, you know, so that hunters could go and blast away all these quails who are planted there for canned hunts so they can just be taken easily. Um, And so they plowed up uh, some turkey nests and along the way. So uh, Joe Hutto, as he describes in his book, he managed to, I think he salvaged um, two clutches of turkey eggs. The eggs had been abandoned by the mother hens. So he discusses in his book, I don't recall what he said, what happened with the first clutch, but the other one is the one he focuses on in his book. And it's very moving. It's a wonderful uh, look at uh, how, of course, they bonded with him from the, he watched them as they were hatching and uh, Mm -hmm. he had to write on a table and he was making eye contact with them. He had his um, chin kind of on the table and making eye contact with these baby turkeys as they were emerging from their shells. But unfortunately, he uh, uses this book to disparage domesticated turkeys. Mm. Well, domesticated turkeys, even their voices don't sound like the real wild turkey. Well, the domesticated turkeys came from real wild turkeys. Real Mm. wild turkeys were taken from their forest homes and by human beings and bred and rebred and inbred and everything else to become the domesticated turkey. So how can you say that, you know, I mean, they didn't ask for that, but how could they defend themselves? Mm -hmm. They are the same turkey. It's just that they couldn't defend themselves against um, human beings uh, grabbing them out of the woods and uh, subjecting them to breeding and uh, all kinds of other artificial uh, inputs. And, uh, uh, you know, and anyway, the, the other thing is that there's nothing stupid about a domesticated turkey. We've had several domesticated turkeys uh, rescued from factory farms, white uh, female turkeys, and uh, two or three of the uh, bronze uh, male turkeys. And uh, there's nothing stupid about them. 
Mm-hmm. They know how to find their way around. They know how to get the things they want to get. Um, they they are very friendly. They can also get into angry moods and then mm-hmm. watch out. <laughs> but that's true of roosters too. You know, to, to roosters will attack you sometimes if they feel you're uh, encroaching on their hens or you know. You, they're, in other words, they're they're not just passive. Um, mm-hmm. they, they have moods and they have uh, the impulses and sometimes they exercise those just like everybody does. But um, there's nothing stupid about turkeys. In fact, one of my books is called More Than a Meal, The Turkey in History, Myth, Ritual and Reality. Mm-hmm. And I have quite a lot to say in that book about the beha- behavior and intelligence of turkeys. I have a whole chapter just on that topic alone. And uh, living with turkeys as I have done and other people who have run sanctuaries or who have worked in sanctuaries will say the same thing. Turkeys mm-hmm. aren't stupid anyway. The fact that they have difficulty walking because they've been bred to be so heavy the, you know, for the turkey meat industry, the fact that if they were rescued from the, that industry, they had their toenails clipped off and their beaks burned off, or at least the upper mandible that makes it more difficult for them to walk and eat because their feet like can't grip the ground properly. And then they're so heavy. And then maybe they've lost part of their beak. Well, that's not, that's not a sign of stupidity. They have been maimed Mm -hmm. by people and they have to adjust to that being maimed. And uh, along with that, be having to adjust to a body that is huge and heavy and alien to who they are. They have to cope with all of this, these man-made impositions upon themselves. And the amazing thing is that they manage as well as they do. In any case, it's not about stupidity. We're the ones who are willfully stupid in and our attitudes toward these birds and other animals. You know, I've heard, for example, I've read and heard things like this. If a, like, if a, a human being who is uh, relatively docile, they'll say, well, you know, this person is just like a sheep, you know, they'll just, or they follow the leader, they're sheep, you know, they're stupid, they're just like sheep. Um, they don't, they don't ec- exercise any uh, independence and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, if you have an animal, for example, who will not, let's say, allow him or herself to be led into a truck that's going to take that animal into to a slaughterhouse, they don't want to go into a dark truck like, for example, an, an ostrich or an emu, then they call them stupid because they resist going in. If they, if they do walk in without fussing, then they're stupid. They're so stupid, they walk to their own slaughter. And then if they won't walk in, they're so stupid, we can't get them into the truck. They're refusing to go into the truck. So again, people just characterize them, uh, animals as they please, and and shift their ground for mm-hmm. deciding what is stupid. Mm-hmm. If you do, if you if you will go into the truck, you're stupid. And if you won't go into the truck, you're stupid. Mm-hmm. So that's something that, you know, that's sort of the part of the lingo and attitude of uh, of uh, animal farming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Your your conviction and wisdom on, on the subject is so inspiring. It's wonderful just to chat with you and hear, hear all of your thoughts on the subject. Um, if anyone would like to ask any questions, I know we have a couple of people who've shared some comments in the chat that I can read out now. Um, but if anyone else has any questions or comments they'd like to share, go ahead and uh, type those in now. Um, Paula mentioned a quote. She says, great quote. We patronize the animals for their incompleteness, for their tragic fate of having taken form so far below ourselves. And therein we err and greatly err. Err. For the animals shall not be measured by man. In a world older and more complete than ours, they are more finished and complete, gifted with extensions of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not they are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations caught within ourselves in the net of life and time. It's a Henry Beston quote. Um, That's beautiful, Paula, thank you for sharing that. Um, And Damodar is also saying, thank you, Karen, thank you, Kurulos. I recommend Joan Dunayers, sorry if I messed up that name. Um, No, you got Joan Dunayer. Denayer, beautiful. Animal equality, language and liberation, and speciesism 
which is beautifully and clearly addresses this issue, distilling it to its essence. Um, thank you for your thank you for your comment and that recommendation. That's we'll absolutely have to have to look that up. Um, it looks like Paula has her hand raised. Did you want to say something, Paula? Um, oh, I, wish, I wish we could eliminate uh, intelligence as a criteria uh, at, completely. Um, if we could get people to just honor animals um, in and of themselves, that they have a right to be, that they have agency of their own, regardless of intelligence. Because when we start talking about intelligence, it gets back to speciesist line of thinking. So, you know, when people say, well, pigs are more intelligent than dogs, I find that problematic. I think that's sending the wrong wrong message for how people should, you know, um, frame these issues. I mean, do, do you agree, Karen? Um, okay, first of all, this is an issue that I have uh, taken issue with <laughs> for decades, and that is uh, ranking animals. Yes. which is ridiculous according to their so-called intelligence right. it's com it, there is no there is no evidence that we can point to that is meaningful that says that a, a pig is smarter than a dog and a whale is smarter than a pig and a dog is smarter than a whale i mean that is the stupidest way of hierarchy establishing a a a mechanical hierarchy of intelligence amongst Animals. I mean, who is more intelligent, a parrot or um, uh, a donkey, uh, a, a wolf or a salamander, a lion or a leopard? I mean, who is the more intelligent, a turkey <laughs> or a tarantula? I, I mean, just as soon as you think about how silly that is, I mean, all animals have their own kind of intelligence. They have developed their own intelligences, I would make that plural. Um, mm -hmm. They could not survive in this world. As I have often said, even a stable environment is not static. You have to be resilient. You have to be able to, as a, an, an animal, as a parent of young, young, uh, as babies of uh, babies and, and, and growing young, uh, you have to be able to uh, be ready to respond to uh, uh, changes in the environment that is, again, maybe stable, but is not static. Uh, you have to be able to respond. You have to be able to make decisions, um, often on the spur of the moment. Uh, so you cannot survive as um, as an individual or as a family or as a species and and be stupid. And the idea of um, uh, ranking uh, a, a pig and a whale. I mean, think how ridiculous that sounds. That's just us uh, imposing a mechanical ladder kind of image on the rest of the living world. I mean, here's this world, again, with all these different types of creatures. Um, and here we are putting a, a mechanical a hierarchical pattern on, on it. Um, I, I, all animals have intelligence. They have the kind of intelligence that they needed to evolve to live in the worlds in which they evolved. They also show an ability in many cases to be able to adapt two worlds that are quite different from the one they evolved in, um, showing that they do have that ability to see in a very different type of world, things that, um, that compare with what they knew in their original world. And they can adapt their behavior to that thing which is different, but still has um, traits in common with what they knew initially. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I just think this whole idea, the worst idea is to suggest that this animal, this type of animal is smarter than that animal. And, uh, and I've heard some, you know, very influential people in our movement, uh, to my horror, uh, keep uh, talking that way. Yeah, and uh, sentient, they, that's Peter Singer, right? On, huh? Peter Singer with the sentience, sentience and intelligence kind of overlap. You know, Peter Singer is defending um, eating um, mollusks and because right, he's assuming right. he, it's, a, it's an arrogance. It's an arrogance about what constitutes intelligence. 
that we we hire our guys. Uh, yeah, it's it's ridiculous, and it's yeah. again the more we learn about all animals, including mollusks and others that have uh, traditionally, until more recently, been considered to be insentient. And yeah, Peter Singer still kind of clings to this idea of well, there's no, you know we don't know for sure that a mollusk. Uh, a clam or a, a shrimp or, you know, an oyster um, is sentient, let alone having intelligence. Um, I mean, all of that is just very, it's very destructive to animal rights and animal liberation and to the animals themselves. And um, it's just a way of thinking that we we need to get rid of. But, you know, again, I've heard, I've read Peter Singer actually say that of all the farmed animals, pigs are the most intelligent. Well, <laughs> He, he doesn't know that. Nobody knows that. And if so, so, so what? Uh, how does how does he invoke the word liberation in the title of his books? Uh, I mean, compared to 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 your and our definition of liberation, which is means not to use, not to use. I mean, he's he's willing to use certain animals in certain situations. So I don't know how he dares to use the word liberation. I really don't, not even in his first book. Right. Okay. Well, the word is definitely based and yes. uh, and uh, almost perverted in the way he certainly is using it now. I mean, the seeds of where he is now were definitely in the first 1975 edition of Animal Liberation. However, that that book at least had an urgency and uh it uh, definitely did not do what he's doing now which is telling people they don't need to be vegan he didn't say that back then now he's telling people uh he's not even suggesting that you necessarily need to transition slowly to being vegan another thing which i get tired of hearing people say telling people that the only way they'll really stay vegan is if they transition slowly. For some people, yeah. For other people, you want to say, hey, if you can wipe your wipe the blood out of your mouth right now and, 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 and wash your hands of all the suffering right now, do it now. Why wait? What's there to wait for, you know? But uh, we're yeah. always giving people this idea, well, you know, take your time. You don't have to hurry, you know. Well, for the animals, you, you, you should try to hurry, okay? Um, but but uh, this idea of, you know, the pigs are smarter. Well, uh, he doesn't know that. That's just an assertion. Yeah. That's just an assertion. That is not a claim that can be backed up. And, you know, when you see so many so many people, they hear about some type of laboratory experiments, okay? Um uh, and they'll say, well, the pig showed more intelligence in this particular experiment than, than maybe the chicken did, who knows, or the turkey or the sheep. Um, but again, different animals respond to different stimuli and different cues, and um, they have different emotional uh, and natures. And it, it, it's just a ridiculous, false uh uh, a, a, a kind of uh, a ranking, but getting there's this idea of liberation. Okay, but what Peter Singer's book now is advocating, and particularly for farmed animals, is not liberation. On the contrary, he is advocating that if they had a good life, um, living with, uh, uh, what is it, um, uh, uh, conscientious omnivores, mm -hmm. and had a painless death, then there should be no reason why you can't eat them. And as you might have seen, I uh, wrote an yes. essay about this um, and it's posted on our website and it's even on our homepage. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I wrote an extended uh, critique of his thinking back in 2011 called What Happened to Peter Singer, in which I look in detail at all of his works and what he had to say up to that point. Um, but I, I, I added to the essay that I wrote, which will go into the next newsletter, the, the more recent one referring to animal, animal, his new book is called Animal Liberation Now. And I said, there, there are two ways of looking at that title, Animal Liberation Now. One is as, a, as a, an incitement for action, like Animal Liberation Now, exclamation point. That's one way of looking at that title, Animal Liberation Now. Now, the other is, this is the state of animal liberation now. It is quite um, deteriorated from what I called it back in 1975. Now it is just, 
treat, treat, you know, treat farmed animals well, and then it's okay to kill them. Or I'm vegan when I'm by myself. Like, who knows when you're by yourself, what you Did do. Did you see the YouTube but, uh, <laughs> interview where he advocates yeah. the, the having sex like when with he's animals? In a so social okay? condition, a situation, or if he's in a plane, for example. Well, if I'm in an airplane and uh, all they offer is, uh, or, or some, any situation really, and all I can get is bread and a salad. Well, then, I, you know, if I can have like free range this or free range that, and who even knows if it's free range? And what does that mean? Because free range animals are all killed anyway after they're no longer, you know, used for their milk or their eggs or whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, so they're all going to be killed if they don't die first. They're all going to be slaughtered, every one of them. Okay. So, and if you're going to eat free range eggs, because, well, they're free range, they got outside, although increasingly more and more so-called free range farmers world over are not letting their so-called free range birds outside at all. Um, because of avian influenza, that gives them an excuse to keep all their birds inside because they say, and this is totally supported by the governments like the United, you know, US Department of Agriculture and the counterparts in Great Britain and the UK and so forth. Well, you know, if one of those birds comes in contact with a dropping from a duck or a goose that had an avian influenza uh, virus in it, then they could all get sick. So it's better to keep them in. Um, and again, I think everybody on, uh, listening in here knows that a free range means that the hens or whatever the animal may be, uh, whoever he or she may be, that that group gets outside in the actual outdoors for a period of the day, at least. Whereas cage free, referring particularly to the uh, hens in the egg industry, um, they are out of metal cages, but they are definitely not free and they are totally confined for their entire lives. But uh, he, so he's admitted and without any apology that he, he consumes free range, what he calls, or what the hostess or host of a, of a party says is free range milk or free range cheese or free range eggs or free range whatever. But for that matter, I, my question is, well, why not just eat free range um, meat type animals too, since uh, they're going to presumably, let's say they get a, get a chance to be outside and they're going to be slaughtered afterward. Just And so are the hens used for egg production and so are the cows used for milk production. So what's the difference? They're all going to be slaughtered anyway, again, if they didn't die first of a disease or something. So what distinctions are you even making between so-called dairy and eggs and uh, 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 the, the flesh of eating the flesh of an animal. So, and, and he's actually said, he said in a New York Times article, I believe that was the New York Times where he said that um, uh, you don't need to be vegan, just uh, cut, cut your animal consumption, animal product consumption in half. And he didn't mean just slowly transition to vegan. He, he stated right out that if you want to eat meat, just eat half as much as you're eating right now. Um, and then uh, he, this whole idea of conscientious omnivores, well, if anybody's familiar with the, the writings of Michael Pollan, who was their sort of their guru, um, he hated, he hated animals. He didn't like animals. He, he said he didn't have any problem uh, with the cow, the calf he followed until the calf was uh, 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 slaughtered or, or loaded into the truck to be slaughtered. He said um, in, in another place in an article in the Smithsonian uh, Magazine a few years ago, um, I know t uh, pigs are very intelligent, but um, I think I could kill a pig. And then he said, as far as the chickens are concerned, he said, I had these chickens and he said, they, you know, um, they, uh, they ate everything in my garden and they couldn't escape from predators and I couldn't wait to kill them. He said, because they would like, if I didn't kill them soon enough, they, the, every, uh, the, uh, the owls and the foxes would get them first. So it just, as, and he said, oh, they're so stupid. They're, the chickens bred for the meat industry, he said, are so stupid. They're not like hens. In other words, they're not like the hen, hens in the egg industry. But the point is, uh, an a point is that, <laughs> Chickens used in the meat industry are, are not just males, they're both female and male, roosters and hens are slaughtered at six weeks old. And um, he just made these comments in the Smithsonian Magazine and gets away with that. So, it, and, and every time, every time an undercover investigation is done of a so-called humane farm, um, animal farm, 
an alternative animal farm. Uh, what do you see? You find horrible conditions. You see cruelty. You see crowding. You see um, birds who are deep beaked. Uh, you see uh, filth. Uh, and, and, and usually these so-called certified humane places, um, when they're certified humane, that doesn't even address the grabbing of them and throwing them into the trucks to send them to slaughter or gassing them in metal boxes right on the uh, property, as is done with so many uh, so-called spent hens, who are only a year and a half old. I mean, they would live for, you know, seven or so years beyond that. Um, so the idea, and as far as a, a farmer killing an animal painlessly, well, that doesn't happen. <laughs> That's ridiculous. They don't give animals painkillers before they cut their throats. Um, and, the, and anybody who thinks that having your throat cut is uh, humane. Well, why don't you ask to be euthanized that way if you think that's humane, uh, having your throat cut? I mean, the throat and the trachea and the skin and everything else of the throat of a chicken, for example, is the same as ours. It's just as much pain, just as much fear of a knife and under your chin, for heaven's sake. So it's very irresponsible how he's talking and he's doing great damage to animal rights, animal liberation and uh, to animals. And it's very disturbing to me how many um, organizations and individuals in our movement who claim to be for animal liberation or animal liber rights or, or call themselves animal advocates have been deferring to him and treating him like he's some kind of this wonderful, you know, well, godfather of animal rights or something, which he's not. Whatever he was in the 70s, he's no longer that. And he's basically said, I'm no longer that. I'll, I'll accept the mantle of being the father of animal liberation, but that's not who, in fact, I am anymore. And I don't apologize for that either. So, Karen, given everything that's been talked about and everything that's been put in the chat and, you know, you talk about things going backwards. Um, and I think that there is some truth to that. But how do we move forward? You know, you've been in this movement a long time. Um, you've obviously, there's always this ride, there's always, sure. you know, um, it, you know, this, well, I guess what I would say, seemingly never ending prog process, right? There has progress been made, and yet there's still these ideals, you know, until human beings are, are willing to accept our role in creating all of this we're always going to ride here, right? Like we've talked about that, you know, this is all, this is all human made. You know, um, I had I've never spent time around a chicken um, until I was responsible for watching a homestead and they had roosters and hens separated, but right next to each other. And my job was to go in and feed them and give them water. And I got scared every time I went in there because I got attacked. And the roosters yet, mean. yeah, exactly. And yet being so somebody excuse me, was this a farm? It was a family homestead, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. And so yet being somebody who understands trauma, I was able to in that moment, like look at it from their perspective. You're in this small little enclosure all day long, all you're waiting for, you know, it's like we created this problem. So I can't be mad at you. I'm going to be mad at the people that put you in this position, right. you know, That's but right. uh, until we as a society start looking at things that way, all we're going to do is keep doing this, right? That's, that's how I feel. Like we, you know, until people start taking the human mantle of responsibility, um, uh, it's not how it'll only change to a degree. Right. And so I think that's where to me, it goes back to the individual. And I think that, you know, for us at Perulo's exploitation is, is our word it's you know not just liberation and it's not just nonviolence. it's exploitation of all forms right we have to stop that and we have to stop and look at where is that everywhere and and that's human to human and that's human to other than human um and so you know do you have any thoughts or suggestions or you know again what does the individual do that can help us at least move in the right direction we can talk probably for the next five weeks on all that's not and all the those kind of things, but how do we move forward? So any thoughts or suggestions on, on what we as a group, and unfortunately the group of people sitting in this 
chat or in this are not really the people, right? We need to address it with these are people that are informed and are trying to do something and, and can see the larger. And yet we do have a responsibility to take that out into the world. And I, I guess the last thing I'll leave, you know, when you guys were talking about intelligence and calling animals stupid, we are that which we see in others. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> We are that which we see in others. So um, until we have our own reckoning, and yet I do feel that there is great stride in, in more and more people understanding that reckoning and that, that moment, and it is now. Oh, well, you know, and answer your question, how do we move forward? Well, there are many ways we can move forward. Uh, first of all, if we really care about animals, we have to stop eating them and their products. Uh, as long as we're exploiting them ourselves, uh, we do not speak with a strong voice to other people. Um, as long as we, you know, it's so ridiculous to say, well, we want the U.S. Department of Agriculture to stop doing this and that to, to these animals. And yet at the same time, we're not even willing to stop like drinking their milk in our coffee, or we're not even willing to stop eating their eggs or saying, well, I still have to have an egg every day. Well, why should, why should the U.S. Department of Agriculture or the National Chicken Council or Tyson Foods, why should they change what they're doing? They don't care about the animals. We, we're the ones who say we care. And yet we're not even willing to change our own behavior. So first of all, we have to step up and change our own behavior to uh, and, and not exploiting them ourselves. And then we can speak with a voice that doesn't sound hypocritical. Uh, and uh, we get the slaughterhouse out of our kitchen and out of our system. And then we go forward. Well, there are so many ways. Okay, we can support legislation uh, that will, at, at the federal level or the state level, that at least will make life a little bit better if it's if the legislation passes into law and that law is implemented uh, for those animals who are never going to live to see a better world, who are just going to die in those terrible places. And that's going to go on for a long time. We can support that kind of legislation. What we should never do is encourage people to consume the products of the animals who get a bit of legislation that at least theoretically improves their lives. Okay, so it's one thing to focus attention on getting um, the poultry industry to change to something better. Let's say stop debeaking your chickens or whatever. Uh, uh, but don't at the same time encourage people to eat uh, or, or eat the eggs of, of hens who happen to not be debeaked. We want to always promote the, 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 the animal free diet. If, let's just focus on diet right now. Let's, we always want to get people to see there's no, there's no cake and eat your, you know, cake, have your cake and eat it too. Okay. Animal farming is not humane. You've got a slave, a piece of property, a, a, a thing that you can kill at will anytime you want, and they have no protection. So the idea of humane farming, humane animal farming is just a falsehood. So we want people to understand that. Not that we're yelling and screaming at them, but we're trying to help them to understand that. Uh, we should always have very, very good literature, not, not a whole sheaf of it, but something very good. Our organization pr produces first-rate literature. I research it. I, I write it. Uh, we have excellent graphic designers. Um, we have excellent literature on chickens, on turkeys, on free range. Life can be beautiful. Go vegan, which includes uh, environmental uh, reasons and everything you want, and, and just a, a lot more. Uh, we attend uh, not every veg fest, but we attend many vegetarian festivals that we can. Um, we have again a wonderful table with lots of information. Uh, we take time to talk to people who come to our table and want more information. Uh, letters to editors when there's an issue uh, about a farmed animal, for example, or on any animal, uh, horse, horse racing. Um, take, take an opportunity to send a letter to the editor. Um, I would strongly recommend, for example, if you haven't already done so, to sign up for Don, uh, uh, Karen Dawn's Dawn Watch, uh, D-A-W-N-W-A-T-C-H. She tracks all of the newspaper and uh, magazine articles um, that feature something about uh, animals and, uh, you know, any, all animals. Uh, and, um, and when she sends out her uh, emails, 
uh, she uh, gives a, 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 a summary of the article and, 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 and how you might respond to it in a positive and educational way. And she includes the link to the letters to the editor and the link to the article itself. So, um, you know, getting, getting your voice out there through the media uh, op-eds, of course, that op-ed means opposite the editorial page. The editorial page is for the editor of the, of the publication itself, and the op-ed is the opposite of the editorial page, meaning um, ordinary readers like you and me. Um, so um, there are many ways you can stand on the street corner and hand out brochures, uh, 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 talk to people, uh, again, support legislation that you feel comfortable supporting on behalf of, of animals, uh, again, at the federal or the state level, um, uh, try to help people just, you know, one of the uh, ways that, that you can talk most effectively to individuals and to groups as well, but certainly to individuals is, you don't want to just lecture them. That never works. Okay. You don't want to talk down to people, but people like stories. We all like to hear somebody's story. So one of the things I do and many good activists I know do is they say, well, uh, you know, because they're asking a question. Well, you know, like, do you, how, you know, do you eat meat or do you, do you still, do you, what about fish? Or they'll even say sometimes like, well, you don't eat meat, but do you eat chicken? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, but he's, I say, well, but you know, growing up, I did eat all of those things. And I, it never even occurred to me, even though I cared about animals from the time I was born, I would fight with my father about hunting when I became about 12 or 13 years old. But we were, I, that was over like a, a several slices of roast beef <laughs> or meatloaf, you know, and it didn't even occur to me. And, and I'll tell them that it didn't occur to me. I wish it had, but it didn't. But then when I read an essay, again, I talk differently to different people. There isn't just one spiel for everybody, but I'll say, you know, I read this essay, or sometimes I'll say, you know, I read this essay by the Russian writer, Leo Tolstoy, or something like that. And I'll say, and it, when he described the, the pity, pitifulness of the cows walking into slaughter and how even the slaughterer said, you know, they trust you and you're leading them into the slaughterhouse. And, you know, when I read that, that just, that's why, that's when I started to eat, stopped eating meat immediately, immediately. That was 1974. I had never thought about that, you know? The cow, that's roast beef. I mean, I was grown up by then, and yet it still didn't, it hadn't, I hadn't made that connection. I would buy a, 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 a barbecued Cornish hen, so-called, um, at the Lexington Market in Baltimore, and I would take it back to my, at that time, boarding house room and sit on the floor and devour it. And as I have said many times, even when I discovered during one of those horrible feasts, um, a, um, a rubbery, long rubbery thing, uh, I, I looked at it and said to myself, like, what is that? But it, it was an aesthetic revulsion. It wasn't like I related to this had been a living chicken or a living hen. This is a beheaded hen, bird. It didn't occur to me even then. It was just like, ooh, what is this, you know? Um, and then I continued to eat, just not that thing. And I ate everything else. Um, and then, you know, 10 years later, 1983, almost 10 years later, for some reason, that nine-year gap, I cannot explain. I cannot, to this day, explain why I didn't realize about... Um, um, dairy milk, what I call mammary milk, and eggs. I continued, you know, drink, you, drinking milk on my cereal and, and in coffee, or, that is dairy milk, and, uh, and, and I would eat eggs, um, not thinking about chickens really at all. Um, and then I read two things in 1983. One was uh, Peter Singer's original Animal Liberation and the chapter on Down on the Factory Farm, that that was it, you know. And then I also read uh, the cookbook for people who love animals, produced a, a vegan cookbook, produced by the farm, a co-op in um, Summertown, Tennessee, which actually produced uh, published my cookbook in, um, uh, instead of chicken, instead of turkey, and also 
prison chickens, boys and eggs. Um, and amongst all the vegan recipes were uh, like little uh, passages of information. And one of them was about how the cows have been bred to have such long, heavy udders that uh, they drag on the floor of the milking parlor. And uh, it, of course, it's very hard on their backs and their whole body, as you can imagine, but that the workers just tramp on their, their udders as they're walking around in there. They just walk on them. And of course, that's very painful. And it's a, a reason why so many cows, virtually all of them, suffer from painful mastitis, which is a painful uh, infection of their, of their udders. So when I read, you know, that Peter Singer down on the farm and then the cookbook who loves people for animals, it was like, that's it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not eating any more animal products and I didn't have to think about it anymore. That, that was just it. And so that's when I became vegan in 1983. And I remember I, uh, the time uh, we were living in Maryland, my husband and I, and, and I uh, was at the Silver Spring uh, Tacoma Park co-op and I mentioned to uh, somebody who was shopping there, you know, how I realized I could no longer drink uh, milk anymore, that is dairy. And um, I said, you know, I, so I switched to Coffee Mate for coffee instead. And she said, well, Coffee Mate isn't vegan. I said, well, what's wrong with it? She said, well, it has a product in it from the slaughterhouse, from uh, pig intestines or something called casein, C-A-S-I-E-I-N. So I remember I couldn't wait to get out of the store and uh, get back home. And I called Alex Hershaft of uh, Farm Animal Reform Movement. And I said, Alex, is it really true that you can't eat, uh, that casein is an animal product? And he said, yeah, Karen, I'm sorry, it is. Uh, so it's not vegan at all. It's a slaughter product. So then, you know, I learned about Eden soy milk. And um, I was very happy with that. I had no problem switching to be Eden soy. And uh, I just, you know, as I learned things, I changed. It wasn't like I always thought it was okay to eat animals, even though I knew what they went through. It was that I didn't know what they went through. And when I learned, I changed my, my, diet, my diet. And that's what I want to encourage people to do. Say, look, if it takes time, take time. But if you can do it now, do it now. Yeah, and I, I think, Karen, you talked to something that's really important, and that is, is that when it becomes personal, right? When yeah, tell your story. How did you change? What caused yeah, you to change? It, yeah, once it becomes personal and people find what that reason is for themselves, that's when people are more apt to, to change. But yet it's also providing people the correct Well, see, first of all, right? you're telling two stories. You're telling your story and you're telling the animal story. Exactly. You see, so you're telling two stories in one. You're not giving them a lecture. You're simply saying, you know, I didn't know. And then I learned. And then I discovered there were, you want to be very positive that there were all these foods available. And this is true. I didn't even know about until I became vegan. You know, it was just, I didn't feel like I was deprived. I learned about all these other things I could eat that instead, things that I never paid any attention to before. Now I knew about them, things that were vegan, the, that I hadn't even heard of before. So, you know, I just learned about new things and it was an adventure. It wasn't like a deprivation for me anyway. That was my experience. So, you know, tell people your story and say, you know, I hope I hope you'll copy me and do what I do. You know, <laughs> that's pretty yeah, what I'm saying. But. Yeah. And it's so important. Um, and, you know, it's it's in those conversations that change happens. And yes, it takes other things, legislation, and it takes community, and it takes a movement, if you will, for that to happen. Um, and, you know, for us, that includes, it's contemplative activism, right? It includes that whole aspect of contemplation, intention, consciousness, um, and really understanding a much larger piece and one's own personal relationship to that piece. And so, um, you know, it, unless the person changes, it starts with each one of us. It starts here. And so um, right. let, there be, that, let there begin with me and then work outward. Exactly. And, and that's where the movement has to occur. Um, is that, that, well, listen, there, we, you know, there are, as you say, there are the hills and the valleys here in animal advocacy, and there always will be just as there are within human rights and, uh, 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 campaigns and efforts, as we already know, um, things don't just go in a straight line of progress. So, uh, human rights 
uh, advocates are still fighting for things that were being fought for a hundred years ago and and more. So, and then you think you've made progress, and then things go backward, and you got to, you know. So we have to face that. That's a, just a reality check, you know. You have, but you have to keep moving forward, even though there are these setbacks that can discourage you. But again, the animals can't afford us to be discouraged. <laughs> we can take a break for a while, just sort of re renew ourselves, but we can't afford, we cannot afford to let ourselves be discouraged and burnt out. We have to remember, you know, meanwhile, these animals are living in hell. And um, when I burn out, um, I, I abandon them to their fate. And I don't want to do that, you know, because they're, that's their fate, well, no matter what I do. So if I could leave this field because I can't stand it, there's, they're stuck there. They, they can't stand it either, but they, they can't get out. So, you know, you, you can go crazy, you can kill yourself, you can quit, or you can keep fighting. Those are your choices. Mm -hmm. Those are your choices. Right. And that's why these, can, yeah. And that's why these conversations and these connections and these communities are so important, right? Because it can also be a very lonely world. It's a lonely world for both sides. Right. Yeah. Sure. Well, we, it's why we need to join groups. And what I started to say exactly. was it, many groups are doing a lot of very good things for animals. We shouldn't think for a minute um, that, uh, that, that, that the animal advocacy movement has failed or that it's not progressing. Uh, again, there are problems within our movement. There are, all, there are always problems in all social justice movements, whether it's the uh, environmental movement or human justice or, or whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, but there are but groups, there are groups and individuals who are doing very, very good work. Um, and I say individuals too, because many people do things in their own community on their own or with a, you know, just a couple of uh, helpers, volunteers and so forth. And yet they can get a lot of traction there on what they're working with. I'm working right now with somebody who is doing a huge amount of work uh, with the, um, uh, uh, the Oberlin Public Library in uh, Ohio. Uh, she, got, she started a campaign against a chick hatching project in which they're hatching these baby chicks started in April this year. And they started it in the first place back in 2022 in this dinky little plastic incubator to try to bring in, you know, more library customers and break in, you know, more donations. Well, this, this activist, she's been a member of ours a long time. I was on the phone with her this morning for over an hour. That was our second big long phone call to talk about. I mean, I can't even describe all the work she's done. If you go to our website, you can go right on our homepage and right in the, just scroll down in the middle and you can read her campaign. Um, and, 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 she, and she's doing even more now. I mean, she has gone to the, uh, the director of the library, the, 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 the people who oversee the director. She's uh, uh, posters, uh, pavement stuff. I mean, she's writing on in the chalk on this is this way to cruelty to people who are walking into the library you know this 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 is the way to cruelty and uh but, but they're doing so much more and i mean she's taken this on as her project and she has attracted you know other uh activists in this very small community and she's you know she's hitting a lot of you know she's getting a lot of uh criticism from the powers that be and uh people uh, but hey, she is undaunted. Uh, she wants to make it at least so uncomfortable for the library that they won't do it again. Again, you know, out of 13 chicks, three died initially, two were born uh, deformed or sick, as she said, and one was born deformed. So out of uh, 13 chicks, three are dead, two are sick, and one is deformed. And, you know, as we talked about today, and she needs is bringing out, you know, this isn't, as I said to her, this, this little rinky dink incubator isn't even on the level of a, um, a an incubator, a, a factory farm incubator. This is just like a little toy. It isn't even a, 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 a factory farm incubator. You know, they want to maximize the number of birds who actually are born. Okay. They're horrible, these incubators, but at least they want to maximize the number who actually, you know, are viable. But this little thing, it, it's just a little toy. And what kind of lesson is it teaching? You know, and uh, it's a sad, pathetic, ugly little thing. And so anyway, this uh, activist, Victoria Hart, she has a very, very sweet and firm personality. She's, you know, she's very, she knows how to talk to people without 
uh, becoming either strident or uh, uh, self-deprecating. You know, she's got the right attitude and she's there for those chicks and she's an educator and she's doing this, just took it up on her own. Of course, she's contacted us and she's been with us for a long time and I'm giving her some ideas and she's running her ideas beside me. And I'm just um, totally in, 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 so impressed because she has spent since April on this. This has been her project and uh, relentlessly. And again, if you take up a project in your own community, there is so much you can do. And then, you know, you can get literature. If you can produce your own literature, you, you know, your own handouts, your own flyers, your own posters. You can also get literature from um, uh, the, the larger groups that can afford to, you know, uh, produce a lot of good literature. For example, she's been passing out our booklet, 16 pages called Alternatives to School Hatching Projects which have all this, has all this, in, the booklets have all this information, including alternative projects, instead of hatching live birds in classrooms, or in this case, in a library. So, you know, once you start putting your thinking cap on and becoming creative, there are just all kinds of things that you can come up with to do in your own community, um, with people locally. Um, again, just lots of things. What you wanna do is come up with uh, projects, campaigns, or actions, that are suited to your time and your talents. It's what can I do? What can I do to make a difference for animals? That's what you wanna ask yourself. Where, what are my skills and talents that I can lend to this huge, important ethical campaign on their behalf? Yeah, and I, I think that's a great note to end on, Karen, because it, it takes those kind of things, right? And it, it's, it's one thing to just, you know, I, I, as a vegan myself, since I'm sorry to say only 2007, um, and yet, you know, it's not just enough anymore for me to, I'm, I don't eat animals anymore. It's, I, I have to do more with that within myself because I do have a responsibility and I am committed to all the animals and to liberation for all, right? And so I can't just you know, walk in my door and not buy things and not be the consumer, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I have a larger responsibility as well. And we all have to figure out what that means for ourselves. It's a very, oh, you that's, know, that's important. And as a matter of fact, since you mentioned that, I had a, uh, got an email from somebody recently, up, yeah, a New Hampshire, an activist, a long standing activist. And she said, it's so disappointing. She said, um, she recently took a stand. She had hoped, she said she was very disappointed. I think it was, a, I'm not gonna remember it exactly right at the moment, but it was against a, like, I, I don't know, a, a bear hunt or something like that in, involving like free living animals, as I recall. And she said, I was so disappointed. She said, she wrote this in a, in a Facebook message to, to, uh, to me and everybody who would read it. She said, nobody came out but me. She said, and one of the things I have to say is that, you know, if, if anybody does come out, it'll be like a few of the animal activists who view themselves primarily as animal activists. She says, but the vegetarians, they never come out. She said they like, she said they come out for social functions, but, you know, eating, but they don't come out to, for actions. And she says, it's just very, very disheartening because, you know, they could be so, what you're saying, you know, start with me, I'm vegan now, but now I got to spread, spread it out. And I need to be there for these animals, whether it's a bear, a fox, a, a chicken, or, or whoever. You know, I should be out there. She was out right. there all by herself. She got an article in the local newspaper. Um, uh, she didn't complain in the newspaper about being all alone and, and not having anybody come out and help her. But she did mention it on the Facebook page, on our UPC Facebook page, how disappointing it is. Yeah, that's so another activist has said, if you have only yourself and you've got one great big good sign or poster, get out there with it. Stand out there with it. What are they going to do to you? They're not going to lock you up, you know, if you're on public property. If it's a good, strong poster, take it out there and stand there. Have a few good pieces of literature and say, here, you might want to learn more about this. Or would you be interested? Or, you know, and, and as I tell people, don't stand there with a leaflets all hugging your chest, hold it out to the person so that they are sort of like 
impelled to take it from you. And also because that's a courtesy, you hand it to them. You don't say, would you like one of these? You know, like you're real timid and scared that they, you know, might say, boo, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hand it out to them. Then that's they can the read it. And when they have time to read it, they'll sit down and read it, presumably, hopefully. Sure. And that's the power of one. And it's not, you know, it's the power of one for all beings. Again, it's, it's not, right. it's not turkey, cow, dog, cat, bird. It's the, you know, it's, it's all beings. And that's, that's, right. that's where, that's where we are, all are connected. We are all beings of the same ilk. So um, thank you, Karen. Olivia, we'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's a brilliant conversation. And it's it's wonderful as always, Karen, to hear all of your, your thoughts and wisdom on the subject. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and taking all, all this time to be here with us today. It's a great pleasure. It's an honor and privilege. And Olivia, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to speak for the chickens, the turkeys and all animals, animal liberation, human liberation. Um, animal liberation includes humans, of course, but <laughs> just to be clear. Yes. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> and, uh, thank you, everybody, for, for joining today. Appreciate it. And thank um, thank uh, Gay so much for uh, oh, making this possible. Absolutely. Right, yeah, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Um, our next speaker in this series will be a week from today on Friday, July 7th at 10 o'clock Pacific time. We will be joined by Tom Harris, an internationally claimed artist, published thank author, you. and social justice activist. Um, as always, if you enjoy Living One and feel called to support Carulos, Living One, and all of our sanctuary residents, please consider donating at the link on our website, carulos.org. Uh, once again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Karen, uh, for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Bye.